stoichiometry. So the first inquiry question is, what happens in chemical reactions? So for this inquiry question, students conduct practical investigations to observe and measure the quantitative relationships of chemical reactions, including but not limited to masses of solids and liquids in chemical reactions, volumes of gases in chemical reactions as well. So we're basically doing calculations that relate to the relationship between masses of solids and liquids and volumes of gases within a chemical reaction. Uh, and we also relate stoichiometry to the law of conservation of mass in chemical reactions by investigating, balancing chemical equations and solving problems regarding mass changes in chemical reactions. So this part, balancing chemical equations, is probably the most important part about this idea of stoichiometry. Um, it's something that a lot of people like tend to struggle with as they um, like start off with. So don't be too afraid if you, it's quite confusing at the very beginning because it has to do a lot with ratios and mathematical ratios and stuff. So it can be a bit confusing and time time consuming, especially when you first start off. But I promise you, as you do it over and over again, as you encounter a lot of balanced chemical equations yourself, it'll become like second nature, especially going to year 12. So don't worry too much about it. Uh, the important thing is with this lecture, we're trying to get you guys to have a general understanding of module two so that when you encounter it in school next term, uh, you're going to be like able to understand it a lot better. So you're not trying to understand, we're not trying to get you guys to know all the intricacies of module two and stuff, just a general solid uh, foundation of knowledge so that when you do encounter it in school, you'll be like a step ahead of like what they're teaching you basically. So with that, let's get into the actual module. So this is uh, 2.1.1. Let's go through the law of conservation of mass. So what is the law of conservation of mass? You might have heard of the law of conservation of energy if you guys do physics as well. So this law of conservation of mass section is a practical dot point. So you'll conduct more about this like in practical lessons in school. Basically, the law of conservation of mass states that matter can neither be created or destroyed. Uh, the law of conservation of energy states that matter can neither be created or destroyed, but only transferred or transformed. This one just says matter can neither be, sorry, energy says that the law of conservation of energy says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only transferred and transformed. The law of conservation of mass states that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And the reason why we do use the law of conservation of mass, mass is if mass can neither be created or destroyed, then the mass of all our reactants has to equal the mass of all our products, right? So that is something that you always need to look out for in your equations. And this is where the, like, the fundamentals of balancing chemical equations comes into play. So Let's look at this question now. So remember the heading over here, mass of reactants has to equal mass of products. So let's look at this. So what is the mass of each reactant for magnesium? So if I pull up my chemistry data sheet now, what is the mass of each reactant? Let me quickly pull up the periodic table. So if I pull up my periodic table right now to answer this question, what is the mass of each reactant? Well, what are the reactants? We have magnesium and oxygen. And if we're trying to find the mass, the mass of magnesium is 24.3-ish. Uh, so 24.31, which is the mass of magnesium. Mass of oxygen, that is 16.00. So we have 24.31 and 16.00. That is the mass of each reactant. What is the mass of the product? Well, the mass of the product is 80.6 grams, right? What is the total mass of the reactants? Well, the total mass of the reactants will do 48.6 plus 32.0 to get a value of 80.6 as well, right? So that's 50 plus 30, yep, 80.6 as well. So we can tell over here if the mass of magnesium is 24.31, oh, sorry, if the mass of a magnesium like, thing is 24.31 and we have 48.6 grams of magnesium, then that means that we have like two, so we have uh, mg, 2 mg, right? Same with oxygen. If it's 16 and we have 32, we have O2. So we have 2 mg plus O2 goes into uh, 2 mgo. So that's kind of what the equation will look like. So let's look at the answer to these questions now. Magnesium, 24.31. Uh, oxygen is 16, uh, 16, just 16 by itself. Uh, what is the mass of the product? 80.6 grams. Uh, what is the total mass of the reactants? 48.6 plus 32.0, 80.6 grams. Does the experimental data support the law of conservation of mass? Explain. So how would you answer this question? Well, the first thing that I would do is I would define the law of conservation of mass by saying the law of conservation of mass states that matter can neither be created or destroyed. Thus, the mass of reactants would have to equal the mass of products as no mass should be created or destroyed, as no mass should be created or destroyed. The equations show that the mass of the reactants, which equals 80.6 grams, is equivalent to the mass of the products, which also equals 80.6 grams. Thus, the experimental data does support the law of conservation of mass, as no mass seems to be lost or gained during the reaction. 
So that's how I would answer this question. It's a little overkill, but I'm like trying to like see, see like if you were paranoid about hitting all the questions or hitting all the marks, getting all the marks for all these, for this final question, that's how you would structure that response. So let's go into the next top point, which is atomic structure and atomic mass. So for this one, we relate stoichiometry to the law of conservation of mass in chemical reactions by investigating balancing chemical equations and solving problems regarding mass changes in chemical reactions. So now we're on 2.1.2. So stoichiometry is the study of quantitative ratios between chemical substances that undergo a physical change or chemical change. So the coefficients are what we look at. So we don't look at this little number two to find the stoichiometric or quantitative ratios. We look at the coefficients, so 2H2O to 2H2, uh, 2H2 to 2H2O. And these are also called molar ratios as well. So if I'm looking at the molar ratio or the quantitative ratio between hydrogen gas and water, the molar ratio is one to one, right? Because it's two to two, which is also equal to one to one. But if I'm looking at the ratio or the molar ratio between hydrogen gas and oxygen, it's now two to one, right? Because two to, well, obviously you don't put one as a coefficient, it's just one. Same with if I'm looking at oxygen gas to water, I get one to two. So that's how you would like use the coefficients to, or like what these coefficients would look like, or the molar ratios, how you would use the coefficients to find these ratios. So with that said, let's move on to how you would apply the stoichiometric stuff. So what we do with this is, or the questions that you'll get in terms of this stoichiometric ratios is balancing chemical equations. So so chemical equations are balanced by ensuring that there are the same number of atoms on each element on the left hand side and the right hand side. So that is the fundamentals of balancing chemical equations. Obviously, if the same amount of atoms are on each side, then they'll have the same mass, right? So it also follows the law of conservation of mass, which is like, you know, the parent branch Then we get to having the same number of atoms in each element in, on each side. And then we have balancing chemical equations. So that's kind of what, like what the chain process looks like. So that is the fundamentals of balancing chemical equations. You just need to make sure that they have the same number of atoms on each side. So moving forward now, let's look at how to balance the chemical equations. So the process of balancing chemical equations looks something like this. So we write down the chemical equation or we have, we give, we're given the chemical equation. Then we determine the number of atoms per element. Then we use a coefficient to balance a single element. And then using that coefficient that balances every single element, we can now continue this for all atoms. And then we check the number of atoms on the left and right hand side are equal. Another important thing is all the coefficients have to be integer values. They can't be decimal places. They can't be fractions. They all have to be integer values. So by coefficients, I mean like these values, so the number two and number two over here and the number one over here, they all, yeah, two, two, the number one over here, they all have to be integer values, right? So let's look at an example. So we have CH4 plus Cl2 goes to CCl4 plus HCl. If we're balancing this now, I'd put a four in front of Cl and a four in front of HCl. So let's look at the number of on each side, right? So I have CH4, one carbon on each side. Very good, so that's balanced. How many hydrogens do I have? I have four hydrogens on the left-hand side. And on my right-hand side, I have the coefficient of four in front of my H, so I have four hydrogens on my right-hand side as well. Now, if looking at Cl2, right? Initially, I had two before I put in the four, but I put in the four now, so now I have eight Cls. So now to balance the, H, uh, to balance the Cl2, I put a four in front of HCl to get Eight hydro to, eight, to get eight chlorines as well. So I have four times two chlorines in my left-hand side, which is eight, and I have four plus four chlorines, which is also eight in my right-hand side. So all my atoms are, all my elements are balanced. And so now we have a balanced chemical equation. All right, so now let's get you guys to balance each of these following equations. So let's go through part A, right? We have, we have iron plus chlorine goes into iron three chloride. So how many ions do we have on each side? Well, we have uh, one on each side, right? We also have chlorines. So it's in, the chlorine is in a ratio of two to, or like there's two chlorines on my left-hand side and three chlorines on my right-hand side. So what is their common denominator? It would be six. So I'd put a two and I'm leaving out iron first because iron is very free, right? Iron isn't restricted by any ratio. So any I can put any number in front of iron. So I'll leave iron to the end. I'll first try and uh, like um, balance chlorine. So. <clears throat> It started by, uh, I said the common denominator is six. So com sorry, common multiple like is six. So I'll, multi I'll put a two in front of Fe. So I get two FeCl3. So now I have six chlorines on my right-hand side. To balance that, I'll put a three in front of my chlorine over here. So now I have three times two, six chlorines on my left-hand side. And I put a two in front of FeCl3. So I put a two in front of Fe as well. So I get two Fe plus three Cl2 goes to two FeCl3. Let's get the answer. 
Very good. 2Fe plus 3Cl2 goes to 2FeCl3. So if I look at count of the atoms now, two ions on both sides and six chlorines on both sides. Let's look at B now. So one iron, two iron, uh, two oxygens, three oxygen. So again, because iron is the most like easiest to like um, balance, I'll look at oxygen first. So again, the common denominator is six between the oxygens. So I'll put a two on Fe2O3 and I put a three in front of O2. So I 3O2 and then 2Fe2O3. So how many ions do I have on my right hand side? I have four because two times two is four. So I have two Fe2, which is four. So I'll put a four in front of ions. So now I have four Fe plus two, four Fe plus 3O2 goes to two Fe2O2, two Fe2O3, sorry. So if I'm looking at the answer now, yep, four Fe plus 3O2 goes to two Fe2O3. If I'm counting the number of atoms on each side now, I get, uh, what do I get? I get four, uh, so I have four um, Fe, so four ions on each side, uh, two times two, four, so four ions on each side. Uh, number of oxygens now is three, is 302, so three times two, six, so I get six oxygens over here and six oxygens over here, so I have six on each side, very good. Uh, my equation is now balanced. Let's go through part C now. This one is where it gets quite hard. So this is now to balance polyatomic ions. So polyatomic ions are things like, you know, sulfate, SO4, SO4, things like that. You can see that they're in a bracket. We consider one polyatomic ion as one thing that we have to balance. So we don't ba we don't break this polyatomic ion into sulfur and oxygen. We break it, we leave the polyatomic ion within itself. So we're balancing one polyatomic ion. So let's balance that first, right? So we have one polyatomic ion over here, one sulfate over here, and three sulfates over here. So I need to balance this by putting a three in front of H2, H2SO4. So I'll put a three in front of H2SO4. So now I have three sulfates, three sulfates on both sides. Um, I have two ions on this side, right? So I'll put a two in front of iron over here. So I have two FeBr3 plus three H2SO4 goes into Fe2SO4 uh, three plus HBr, but I don't have enough hydrogens and I don't have enough bromines on my right hand side. So how many bromines do I have on this side? Well, I'll put a two in front of FeBr3, so I have six bromines on my left hand side. How many uh, hydrogens do I have on my left hand side? Well, I'll put a three in front of H2SO4, so I have six hydrogens. So I have six bromines, six hydrogens, uh, well, it fits perfectly. I'll put a six in front of HBr. So I have two FeBr3 plus three H2SO4, goes into one Fe2SO43 plus six HBr. So that's how I would balance that. So let's check this now. Two FeBr3 plus three H2SO4 goes into one Fe2SO43 plus six HBr. So that's how I would balance this kind of chemical equation. Cool. Now let's go. So these are a couple hints in terms of balancing chemical equations. So Make sure to adjust the coefficients, not the subscripts. So like, you know, obviously we're not balancing, we're not balancing based on like, we're, we're balancing the coefficients, right? Not the subscripts. So we don't turn, turn a BR3 into a BR6. We leave it as BR3, we're changing the coefficients, but we do use the subscripts to determine how many of those elements are present within the right and left-hand side respectively. So don't ignore the subscripts because we need to know how many elements there are on each side or in, how many atoms there are on each side but make sure that you don't balance the subscripts, you balance the coefficients. The other thing is if there are any even and odd like uh, pairs, then you should multiply them both by two to make everything even. And if, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, we consider the polyatomic ion as a whole. So this sulfate, we don't break it up into sulfur and oxygen. We consider polyatomic ions as whole. Now we also check the balanced chemical equation at the end to make sure we got it right. So examples of these love love like applications of these uh, balancing chemical equations uh, goes as such so uh, we have zinc sulf uh, sulfate so ZnS plus O2 goes into ZnO plus SO2 so is this equation balanced well let's check it out so I have one zinc on both sides so zinc is balanced one sulfur on both sides so sulfur is balanced but I have two oxygens on my uh, left hand side and three oxygens on my right hand side so there's an odd even um, like there's an odd even uh, disparity, right? So to get rid of that disparity, what I'll do is I'll take my odd, so I'll take the area that is odd and I'll multiply that by two. So if I multiply everything that is odd, so my right hand side by two, I get two ZnO plus SO2. So now I make O even. So I have four oxygens on this side. So I have, sorry, do I have four? Yeah, I have four oxygens on this side, right? Now let's balance the Zn, S and O. So let's balance the Zn now. So I have two zincs on this side. I'll put in two zincs on my left hand side as well. So I have two Zn, S plus O2 goes into two Zn, O plus SO2. Now let's balance the sulfate. So if I put two Zn, S, I have two sulfates over here. So I need to put a two in front of SO2 to get two sulfates on my right hand side. 
Now let's finally balance the oxygens, right? How many oxygens do I have now? So because oxygen is a standalone thing, oxygen is the easiest one to to um the easiest one the easiest one to uh like basically balance. So if I'm balancing this now, I get two oxygens plus two O2. So I have six oxygens on my right hand side. So I'll put a three in front of O2 to get six oxygens on my left hand side as well to get a total value of of 2ZNS plus 3O2 goes into 2ZNO plus 2SO2. That is my final example over here. Now let's look at my next example. So I have lead nitrate plus uh, sodium chloride goes into sodium nitrate plus lead chloride. So the important thing is here is we're balancing nitrate as a whole. So because it's a polyatomic ion. So nitrate is even on the left and odd on the right. So we multiply the nitrate on the right by two to make the amount of nitrates even. So now I have two and two sodium nitrate plus PbCl2. So I have two sodium. So now I need to balance the sodium on the, the left hand side as well. So I put in two NaCl. So now let's check if it's balanced. So I have one lead, one lead. So lead is equal on both sides. Two nitrates, two nitrates, which is equal on both sides two sodiums, two sodiums, equal on both sides, two chlorines, two chlorines, equal on both sides. So that's all I had to do for this example to balance the entire chemical equation. So that's what balancing chemical equations looks like. It does look pretty tedious, but trust me, as you repeat it over and over again, it becomes basically second nature. So with that said now, uh, we have basically at this point summarized stoichiometry, the law of conservation of mass, uh, we've also summarized the mass of reactants and the, which so basically the law of conservation of mass indicates that the mass of reactants equals the mass of products and from that we've branched into balancing chemical equations looking at the coefficients to make sure that they're the same uh, stoichiometry and things like that so that's kind of what we've done so far if you guys have any more questions or if you want to you know learn about it more slowly you guys can go back through the video pause it look at the different sections uh, read through the slides even more and if you have any questions whatsoever feel free to drop a question in the online and live q a chat and i'm i'm there basically answering all your questions so don't be afraid to ask any question that you have okay so let's go through our questions now so uh, 63.10 grams of sodium metal reacts with 188 grams of solid iodine. Calculate the mass of sodium iodide produced, assuming that all the reactants are used up. So what are we using? Like what concepts that we've learned so far are we using for this question? Well, the concepts that we're using is the law of conservation of mass, right? So they've given us two mass values. So we're probably going to be using the law of conservation of mass here. What is the law of conservation of masses? It says matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And then that means that the mass of our reactants has to equal the mass of our products. So if all our reactants are used up, then all of our reactants are transferred into our products. So everything that is all the mass in our reactants is transferred into the mass of our products. And so the 63.1 grams plus 188 grams should be transferred into our product. So we add these two and the total mass of the reactants should equal the total mass of the products. And if we only produce sodium iodide in this reaction, then sodium, the mass of sodium iodide should equal to the total mass of our reactants. So let's check it out. So 63, so yep, assuming all the reactants are used up, so the mass of NaI is equal to 63.1 plus 188.0, which is equal to 251.1 grams to four significant figures. So yeah. The molar ratio doesn't matter in mass to mass stoichiometry because we're trying to like find mass here. So because we're only using the law of conservation of mass. So we'll talk about molar ratio later. It might seem like a foreign concept. We'll talk about it a bit later and you can see how we like use or implement molar ratio in our questions. So for this example, you should get an answer of 251.1 grams to four significant figures. Why four significant figures? Well, if you guys don't know, this is the law for the, law, the shortest amount of significant figures. Basically, you look at the data that they've given you and you look at the data that you've used in your question and we, you find the data with the lowest amount of significant figures have you, that you've used in the question and your answer should be written to that amount of lowest significant figures. So if they gave us 63 instead of 63.10, then the lowest amount of significant figures that we used in the question to get our question, to get our answer, sorry, is two because it's 63 instead of 63.10. So our answer will be the two significant figures now. So our answer will be 250 instead of 251.1. But because all the data that we gave and that we were given and all the data that we used is to four significant figures, our answer will be to four significant figures as well. So that's how the, 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 idea of like significant figures works as well. So next question.